Welcome to the October edition of ID, IIDR Rounds. I'm Lori Burroughs, the Associate Director of the Institute. And I'm very happy today to introduce our two speakers uh, who are going to talk about influenza. We've been so focused on COVID, but our old enemies have not left us. <laughs> So our first speaker is Dr. Mark Loeb, who is a professor in the Departments of Pathology and Molecular Medicine and Health Research Evidence and Impact. He's the co-director of the McMaster WHO Collaborating Center on Infectious Diseases and host, holds the Canada Research Chair in Infectious Diseases. Dr. Loeb's research focuses on vaccine clinical trials, and today he's going to be speaking to us about a randomized trial examining the impact of influenza vaccination on cardiovascular outcomes. Our second speaker today is Dr. Matt Miller. He is our new scientific director of the Institute. So congratulations, Matt, we're delighted. Um, he is a associate professor in the Department of Biochemistry and Biomedical Sciences. And Dr. Miller specializes in viral pandemics, especially those caused by influenza and SARS-CoV-2. Today, he'll be speaking to us about vaccines and antibodies as tools for influenza prevention. So thank you both for joining us. And Mark, I will hand it over to you. Okay, well, yeah, thanks. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. So I'm gonna be talking about this, this randomized trial where we looked at influenza vaccine in patients with heart failure to uh, reduce adverse vascular events. So the background is that, you know, heart failure is really uh, a major global burden to health. In fact, it, it's estimated that there are around 64 million people with heart failure. And this was a few years ago in 2017, and that's sort of doubled since the 1990s. Um, the all-cause first-year death rates are about 23 per 100 person year. So lots of morbidity related uh, to you know, hospitalizations and patients with heart failure and deaths. So it's a very, very serious condition and huge global burden. Uh, and we know, of course, that the burden of influenza is huge. Every uh, year, influenza epidemics cause up to 1 billion cases of influenza, 3 to 5 million cases of severe influenza-related illnesses. And it's es estimated that there are 290,000 to 650,000 deaths worldwide. So, of course, uh, as we all know, it's a leading cause of uh, vaccine-preventable death. So the infection itself has been associated with increased risks of cardiovascular events and deaths. Really, there have been these um, case, really sort of a case control studies uh, looking at uh, influenza, sort of anchored by timing myocardial infarctions. And if you compare cases to controls, the risk factor for having a myocardial infarction or even a stroke after uh, an infection with influenza is about sixfold higher than if you didn't have it there. And that's been really reproduced in about three or four studies. Um, and there have been also lower rates of ischemic cardiovascular events, things like myocardial infarctions and strokes that have been reported to have been reduced with, uh, with influenza vaccination. Uh, and there have been really three main major clinical trials in the area of cardiovascular outcomes in influenza vaccination. So what I'm going to be presenting to you is the third trial. Um, and I'm just going to go by, by sequence sort of backwards. This is actually the second trial, and it was called Influenza Vaccination after myocardial infarction, a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled multicenter trial. And what they did here, they were looking more at acute myocardial infarction and acute coronary syndrome. So they, um, they enrolled patients who were fresh after uh, myocardial infarction, and they randomized them to either the influenza vaccine or placebo. It was done mainly in European countries. Um, their first outcome was cardiovascular death, myocardial infarction, or stent thrombosis. And you can see they, they presented almost about a 30% risk reduction with the influenza uh, vaccine. Uh, and they had an effect on all-cause death as well, about a 40% risk reduction, um, and CV death, uh, and a trend towards uh, a reduction in myocardial infarction. Uh, part of the criticism of the study, though, was they ended early, so they didn't really complete their whole the whole trial, and um, so it was criticized that sometimes things change when you 
when you start a trial and you, you don't uh, don't complete it. So that was the major criticism. Then. But uh, otherwise, it was a well conducted study. Um, in terms of, but that study wasn't dealing with heart failure. If, if, if we look at the literature in uh, heart failure and look at what studies have been done with respect to influenza vaccination and sort of reducing outcomes like death or hospitalization, there's one systematic review and meta-analysis that sort of put it together. So they, they looked at uh, patients, again, it wasn't randomized, so there's always the chance of residual uh, confounding, but they looked at uh, all-cause mortality, and they did find that if you summarize these observational studies, there is a, a risk reduction with influenza vac vaccine, maybe about 20% or so for all-cause mortality. Uh, for cardiovascular mortality itself, there was really not much of a, direct, uh, a reduction. Uh, and for all-cause hospitalization, it was really a, a, a null effect. Um, and if you look at other, there have been other observational studies about the effect um, of influenza vac vaccination in heart failure patients. And it's sort of, I'd say, it's a sort of a mixed bag. Some studies have shown a reduction in all-cause hospitalization. Others, uh, others have not. Um, and the other study, so that was uh, one of the, the three, uh, the, uh, another uh, important trial was what's called the INVESTED trial. Here they were looking at, basically there was not a, a control arm, they were looking at two different formulations of vaccine. So they compared a trivalent uh, high dose vaccine to a standard dose quadrivalent influenza vaccine. So the trivalent would have two strains of A and one strain of B, the quadrivalent would have the extra strain of B in it. And interestingly, and they, this was a well-powered trial, they were you know, designed for uh, a sample of 9,000 participants. They found basically no effect. It was just a, a, null, uh, a null effect. So that was, uh, that was sort of a, a disappointing uh, result. So moving on to our trial, where we uh, decided to do a uh, pragmatic trial uh, to look at um, the effect of the influenza vaccine in low and middle income countries. And that's because about 80% of the burden of influenza is in people who live in low and middle income countries. So it was a pragmatic double blind randomized trial. We were comparing the inactivated vaccine to placebo to prevent cardiovascular outcomes. And we did this in 10 countries in Asia, the Middle East, and Africa over flu over three influenza seasons. Now, the overall duration of the trial was uh, about six years. So it was a, you know, with a, and a, another year of a, a pilot study. And we used a placebo, and this was in keeping with the WHO criteria for use of placebo trials and vaccine trials in low and middle income countries. Uh, as well, we also allowed participants to uh, use the influenza vaccine outside of the trial. So we enrolled uh, patients over the age of 18 who had a clinical di diagnosis of heart failure and New York Heart Association functional class two to four. So that New York Heart Association fun functional class just means you know, the, the higher the number, the worse your heart failure is. And we excluded those that had a previous anaphylactic reaction to a previous dose of uh, trivalent inactivated vaccine. Also, at the time, um, egg allergy was a contraindication, so we, we excluded, and it's no longer, by the way, but we excluded those that had some sort of hypersensitivity reaction to eggs. Um, we excluded those with Guillain-Barre syndrome within eight weeks of a previous flu vaccine. And anything, any anaphylactic reaction to neomycin, which is a component of the vaccine, uh, participants were excluded. Um, we excluded those that had had influenza vaccine in two the previous years, which was very few. And we excluded those who had severe valve disease where repair or replacement was considered because then that would actually change their risk over the course of the study. And, and we didn't want that. So the study vaccines, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the experimental vaccine was an in inactivated influenza vaccine. And we used Vaxigrip, which is a product made by Sanofi. And the reason for that is uh, we were doing this in you know in 10 countries and, and this vaccine happened to be licensed in all of 10. So uh, that made it very practical. Uh, we used for the most part, the trivalent formulation because the quadrivalent wasn't licensed in most of the countries. It became licensed in, in India 
And again, where it was licensed, we would use it. So we used it for one season in India. And the control was a placebo, which was sterile saline. And we administered the vaccines, uh, the study vaccines annually for three influenza seasons. So that means we weren't re-randomizing. So if someone, a participant was randomized at the very beginning to the flu vaccine, they would continue to get that same vaccine over three years. So the uh, outcomes, the primary outcomes were what we call co-primary outcomes. The, the first uh, primary outcome was a composite of cardiovascular death, non-fatal MI, and non-fatal stroke. And this is a very common composite outcome that uh, people use in cardiovascular trials. Uh, the second uh, co-primary outcome was, the, was really the first co-primary outcome and heart failure hospitalizations. And the other difference uh, between the first and the second was the second was recurrent uh, events. The secondary outcomes included the components of the primary, that's non-fatal MI, non-fatal stroke, cardiovascular deaths, and we also looked at all hospitalizations, pneumonia, uh, and all deaths. So we estimated that with 5,000 participants, we would have 80% power to detect a reduction in the primary composite from 17% uh, in the control group to 14% in the uh, influenza vaccine group. So the primary analysis was uh, by intention to treat, which means that everybody who's randomized, no matter actually what they get, they, they get random, they get allocated to they get analyzed to what they were originally allocated. So it's a very conservative way of doing the analysis. Um, and the other thing is that we looked over events irrespective of when influenza was circulating, because in many of the countries that we were looking at, particularly in Africa, the seasonality isn't very well defined. So we felt that it was best to look at, at all the events over the, the, the duration of the trial. And we used an approach called a step-down fallback approach, where the first primary uh, composite outcome was tested at a p-value of 0.04. And if it was not significant, the second primary was tested at 0.01. So you could see we sort of split up the p-value um, to do this. Uh, the secondary analysis were time to events for the secondary outcomes. Here we are looking uh, at recurrent hospitalizations for heart failure uh, and at recurrent all-cause hospitalizations. Now, very critically, actually, we did an analysis of events, and this was pre-specified. It wasn't post hoc. It wasn't. It was before we, we saw the data and we specified this in the protocol. We did an analysis of events that occurred during peak influenza circulation, and we compared that to events that occurred outside of peak influenza circulation. So this is a, just a slide of the, the distribution. You can see the countries in Africa, including Nigeria, Uganda, Kenya, Zambia, and Mozambique. We had sites in Saudi Arabia, UAE, a site in India, a site in China, and a site in the uh, Philippines. So a very broad geographic uh, area being represented over multiple seasons. And I just wanted to, you know, just show you, you know, uh, just an example. This is Zambia. Just this, this is what happens over, um, uh, you know, seasons, particularly in African countries. So it's uh, there. There are some countries, for example, that have influenza circulating year round. There are other countries like Uganda and Mozambique that have peaks both in the fall and in the spring. And sort of we made use of this because we wanted to increase our sample size. And for those countries that had peak, uh, peak influenza activity, both in the fall and in the uh, spring, we, we create a double cohort so that we, even within one country, we'd follow a cohort that was subject to the, the, the fall season another cohort that was subject to the, the spring season. We couldn't do that in, in all the countries, um, but we were able to do that. And we mapped out what we thought was the best ev uh, evidence for seasonality as well for that, that sort of peak uh, circulation of influenza analysis. So we looked, rec looked to use records from the WHO, from CDC, 
uh, contacted people at WHO, looked at whatever surveillance records were, uh, were available, and certainly challenging. Um, this is a, an example of peak influenza circulation that was published uh, on seasons in India. And, and you see that, you know, it really depends geographically. At some, some areas um, in, um, in India, you'll have like a northern hemisphere, quote unquote, northern hemisphere season, sort of a fall winter influenza season. Uh, in other areas, the, the activity begins in the spring. So, you know, going through the study, we found that it wasn't, it wasn't really about whether someone was in the northern hemisphere or the southern hemisphere. It really just depended on knowing when the peak uh, activity of influenza uh, was. Uh, this is a similar thing for China. This is just a mapping of the, of the distribution of influenza surveillance. And, and for China, most of our sites were, were in the northern region. So they followed their distribution that, were, that was sort of close to what we see uh, in Canada or the US. So in terms of the results, this is the, uh, the baseline characteristics. So you can see that by, um, if we look at, at age, they, the, uh, the study groups were, um, there's a good balance there, a heart rate, systolic blood pressure, sex, all very well balanced. And you can see most of the participants were enrolled from either India or countries in Africa, as well, of course, as I mentioned, uh, China, Philippines, uh, and the Middle East. Uh, in terms of uh, heart failure, when we look at the, again, very well balanced, but you can see that most of the uh, participants were in class two or class three, uh, New York Heart Association functional class for heart failure. And their left ventricular function was in the, the moderate to severe group for the most part, over 55%, which meant that, you know, they, they weren't dealing with hearts that were, uh, that were so good. Uh, they, they had considerable heart failure, and this was clinical heart failure. Um, and as you can imagine with people with clinical heart failure, there are a lot of comorbidities. So uh, again, well distributed between the, uh, the groups, as you could see, but individuals, a majority had hypertension, over 20% had had a previous MI, uh, over 20% was diabetes, uh, had diabetes, and it, and it was estimated that about 30% of them had um, ischemic-related heart failure, so it's heart failure based on, on ischemia. And these are their uh, medications, so again, the majority was uh, were on beta blockers, 70% uh, were on angiotensin receptor blockers, a majority on, on, on diuretics and, and uh, a majority on antiplatelet agents. So more or less what you would uh, what you would expect. So these are the results. This is the again the very conservative analysis looking at all uh, all events. So if we look at the first the primary outcome, there were 380 events in the influenza vaccine group, and that translated to about 15 percent. Um, of, of participants had that had the primary outcome. In the placebo, there were 410, and that translated to 16%. And the hazard ratio, uh, the point estimate was 0 0.93, with confidence intervals from 0 0.81 to 1.07. So that you know, certainly was not a significant effect. And similar story for the secondary um, uh, co-primary outcome. There were 520 uh, events in the vaccine group. Um, translating to 20% or so, and 586 in the placebo group, which is 22%. Again, the hazard ratio was uh, similar to the first co-primary, 0.91, with confidence intervals ranging from 0.81 to 1.03. Uh, all cause deaths, again, weren't reduced. The hazard ratio was 0.9, with confidence intervals from 0.9 to 1.03. Similar findings with cardiovascular death, um, non-CV death, and very few outcomes actually with non-fatal MI and non-fatal stroke. You see very, very few outcomes and, and there was not a significant effect there. Uh, however, when we looked at all-cause hospitalizations, uh, there were uh, 388 or 15% of events in the vaccine group versus 455 or 17% of the placebo group. So there, there was a, a significant effect, about a 15% risk reduction with confidence intervals ranging from 0.74 to 
Um, heart failure uh, hospitalization wasn't significantly reduced, but the trend was there. Uh, and for pneumonia, we had a substantial effect, about a 40% risk reduction. So you could see that a hazard ratio of 0 0.58 with, um, that's the point estimate with confidence intervals from 0 0.42 to 0 0.8 with a very significant p-value of 0 0.0006. Um, recurrent events was, you know, for the secondary, uh, for the uh, secondary co-primary outcome was very similar, uh, the hazard ratio of 0 0.92, the point estimate, and there wasn't significant effect. However, there was a reduction in all uh, hospitalizations at 0 0.83, and that was uh, a point estimate, so close to 20% risk reduction in heart failure hospitalizations uh, wasn't reduced. Now, this is the data, again, pre-specified data where we looked at first events during peak influenza season and compared them to, to outside the influenza season. And we used the same outcome. So we looked at our first co-primary outcome uh, and there, there was a significant effect. The, the hazard ratio was 0 0.82, about an 18% risk reduction uh, with confidence intervals from 0 0.68 to 0 0.99. And that is, you know, in real distinction to what happened in outside peak influenza season, there was really no effect. The hazard ratio there was 1.08. And when we looked at the secondary co-primary outcome uh, this way, it was very similar. It wasn't significant, but there was a trend down towards a, a reduction during peak influenza circulation. And that's just dissipated, right? 0 0.96 is very close to the null. There was no effect. Um, we looked at, uh, when we looked at all cause of death, actually during flu season, uh, there was a 20% risk reduction, as you could see, uh, hazard ratio of 0 0.79. Outside of flu season, no effect. Cardiovascular death, same story during peak influenza season, a significant effect, you know, almost 25 over, uh, almost a 25% risk reduction outside of flu season. It just, the effect just goes away. Um, and again, uh, all-cause hospitalizations, uh, there was a trend towards reduction with peak influenza season. And actually, that persisted outside of flu season. Uh, heart failure hospitalizations actually were reduced actually significantly outside of peak influenza season. And pneumonia was actually reduced substantially, as before, uh, both during peak influenza season and outside of peak influenza season with about almost a, a halving of the rate, uh, about a 50% risk reduction during peak influenza season. These are the, the Kaplan-Meier curves of the, the primary outcomes. So this is you know, what I showed you really. There's no effect when we look at everything, whether flu is circulating or not. Uh, however, when we looked carefully and tried, did our best to define the influenza season, um, we, in retrospect, we, we were very successful at doing this because we found, uh, again, a, a significant effect during peak influenza season and nothing during non-influenza season, which, of course, you, what you would expect, uh, flu vaccine is not going to work uh, outside of flu seasons, and the same thing with the uh, secondary primary outcome. So just to summarize then, there was uh, no significant difference in the primary outcomes uh, between participants assigned to the flu vaccine versus placebo. Uh, however, the secondary outcomes, uh, even in the primary analysis of pneumonia and hospitalization were substantially reduced in the influenza group. And in particular, when we looked at uh, times of peak influenza circulation, there was a significant reduction in the first primary outcome and in deaths and pneumonia in the flu group, uh, flu vaccine group, rather compared to uh, to placebo. And I'd like just to acknowledge our funding agencies. It was really funded, the study was funded by the MRC uh, UK, uh, part of my foundation grant, the, the actually operating grant, uh, CHR never, <laughs> never funded. That's why I had to hunt around for another place to get funding. But anyway, we finally got funding uh, and Sanofi uh, kindly provided uh, the vaccines uh, in kind. And this is slide just um, shows all the investigators uh, from the from the different countries and our colleagues uh, at PHRI. And I'll stop sharing there. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, and we'll turn it over to Matt now. Okay. Thanks. <clears throat> thanks very much, Dr. Burroughs. 
Um, so I'm going to try and dovetail on uh, Dr. Loeb's um, presentation today uh, and give you sort of a, an update on um, strategies for prevention of influenza. So, uh, of course, we've all been sort of reeling over the last almost three years now um, through uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. But of course, uh, you know, as a population, we're really no stranger to viral pandemics. Um, and the pathogen with which we're most familiar in this context is, of course, influenza. Um, over the course of roughly the past hundred years, there have been uh, five prior influenza pandemics, the most recent of which was in 2009 uh, and was caused by an H1N1 so-called uh, swine flu triple reassortant virus. Now, uh, just for orientation, because my uh, part of this presentation is going to be more immunological, uh, influenza virus is an enveloped virus with a negative strand RNA genome that's segmented. Um, really, all I want you to focus on, though, is that this lipid envelope is decorated primarily by two viral glycoproteins, hemagglutinin, which is uh, a trimer, and neuraminidase, which is uh, a tetramer. And these are the primary targets uh, of the antibody response. In particular, it's antibodies against hemagglutinin, which current seasonal vaccines against influenza are designed to elicit. Most of those antibodies bind to what's called this globular head domain. So I'm showing you here a space-filled um, structure of hemagglutinin with these uh, ribbon diagrams of FAB regions of antibodies bound to various epitopes. Uh, however, there are a, a really specialized subset of antibodies that bind to highly conserved epitopes in a stock domain. And these antibodies have the capacity to protect against very broad strains of influenza, um, as I'll tell you about later in the presentation. Now, uh, globally, there are roughly five types of licensed influenza vaccines available. There are uh, live attenuated influenza vaccines. Uh, these are administered mucosally, and these will become a, a major focus of this presentation. Recombinant vaccines, which are made uh, from purified hemagglutinin alone, and these are currently produced in uh, insect cells. Whole inactivated vaccines, uh, and while licensed, these types of vaccines are the one exception in this slide that are not uh, currently available in North America. Split vaccines, which are essentially viruses that are, are killed um, by detergent-based uh, uh, lysis and breaking apart of the viral particles, and subunit vaccines, which are sort of a, a more purified version of split virus vaccines and also contain uh, pieces of inactivated virus. Now, although seasonal vaccines uh, are very effective at reducing risk of influenza virus infection, um, one problem with our approach to controlling flu is that seasonal vaccines don't protect uh, against pandemics, because of course our seasonal vaccines have to be reformulated and readministered every year. And by definition, we can't protect when a pandemic will happen. One really important consideration though, is that very different from the situation we were in in the context of COVID-19, when the 2009 swine flu pandemic happened, we had a huge global infrastructure that was already capable of producing influenza virus vaccines. And when the swine flu virus was declared a pandemic, there was a huge global effort to manufacture a new vaccine that would protect against that virus. What I'm showing you here though, is that those efforts um, were not very fruitful. So in blue, what I'm showing is the cases of influenza-like illness over various months through the early stages of the pandemic. In red, what you can see is the number of these vaccine doses against the novel swine flu virus that were shipped, and then in green, the doses administered. So even in a situation where we had the know-how to make these vaccines and an existing global infrastructure to produce them, we couldn't produce them fast enough to really mitigate 
the majority of the infections caused by this pandemic. Likewise, in the context of COVID-19, even after the incredibly rapid um, generation and approval of COVID vaccines, you know, we're now, we're now almost two years out from the approval of those vaccines and, and the pandemic is still raging. And of course, that's in part due to the fact um, that these viruses are capable of evolution uh, and can uh, escape pre-existing immunity. And while the COVID-19 pandemic has been really bad, some of us, I guess, would probably question whether things should actually get any worse. Uh, what I want to highlight is that they certainly could. So the 1918 uh, H1N1 Spanish flu is widely considered to be the greatest natural disaster in human history. And that's largely um, a function of the number of individuals it affected over a very short period of time. Over roughly two years, this virus resulted in the death of three to 5% of the global population at the time. And if we extrapolated the population in 1918 to today, that would amount to roughly 370 million people, which is approximately the combined population of Canada and the US. Now, by contrast, with COVID-19 in, in the context of the current population, we're over 6 million deaths at this point. So um, you can see that, that things really could be a lot worse. Now, this slide I've shown almost since I, I began working in the flu field, and I think over the last few years, we've seen that, that this is unfortunately very true. Um, which is that despite the huge number of medical advances we've made over the past hundred years, there's really been no major improvements in pandemic preparedness. Um, and uh, that has really put the, the population at, at great risk. So although in the wake of COVID-19, there's been a lot of effort placed on increasing our ability to respond quickly when infectious disease threats emerge, I hope what I've, what I've conveyed in these early slides is that even in the best case scenario, response is not the optimal way to prevent um, global infectious disease outbreaks or pandemics. We really need to focus the majority of our efforts on preventing these outbreaks before they occur. And one of the important tools to do that, of course, is, is via vaccines. Now, as many of you know, the root of exposure to a pathogen uh, really profoundly influences um, uh, the nature of our immune response. So when we are given uh, a parenteral vaccine or a vaccine that's injected in the skin or in the muscle, what we primarily see is the, um, is the uh, induction of circulating T cells and, and antibodies, especially of the IgG isotype. By contrast, when we're exposed to antigen or infected with a pathogen uh, in our uh, mucosal tissues, we see a profoundly different type of immune response, which is typified by the production of local secretory IgA, induction of tissue resident T cells, uh, and as we've learned recently, the induction of localized trained innate immunity. Now, our propensity to vaccinate parenterally, I think really harkens all the way back to sort of generian vaccination in the days of smallpox, where uh, inoculation or scarification was used to transfer um, uh, pathogen and antigen from the scab of an infected individual to a naive individual in order for that naive individual to mount a protective immune response. And while this is convenient, as you can imagine, it, it's probably not the optimal way to protect against mucosal pathogens. However, what many people don't know or, or sometimes forget is that, you know, centuries before that, um, the cultures in Asia and India were practicing intranasal insuppuration, whereby they would take and grind up this scar tissue and blow it into the nose of a naive recipient in order to generate mucosal immunity. Now, mucosal immunity, I think, is particularly interesting to study in the context of influenza because one of our best known uh, and, and sort of um, longest approved mucosal vaccines is, of course, the LAIV seasonal influenza vaccine or flu mist. And, and this vaccine is given 
uh, uh, in the nose via a nasal spray. Now, uh, Mark and I have been working together for, for many, many years. Uh, and, as, and as I'm sure most of this audience knows, Mark has made really seminal contributions to the understanding of relative vaccine effectiveness in um, Hutterite communities in Alberta using cluster randomized control trial designs. Um, he's conducted uh, three of these sort of major studies to date. And the middle one was a comparison of the live attenuated influenza vaccine versus the inactivated or intramuscularly administered influenza vaccine. And this happened several years ago, uh, uh, sort of in the wake or the years after the uh, 2009 pandemic, and, and was partially motivated by the fact that there had been some suggestion that the live attenuated vaccine might be um, inferior to the inactivated vaccine in inducing protective immunity in children. So Mark uh, designed the RCT uh, shown here to, to assess that question. And what he found uh, over three years was that these vaccines were essentially equivalent in their ability to protect children from influenza virus infection. And this study was, was really critical in terms of its ability to inform policy because it basically caused a, a reversal of the US ACIPS uh, um, initial preferential recommendation for children to receive the inactivated vaccine over the live attenuated vaccine. Um, that initial recommendation was based really largely on sort of observational studies that lack the rigor of these cluster randomized control trials. As a follow up to that, um, uh, my group worked with Mark's group to, to look at the immune response that was generated by these vaccines. And what we found was that uh, consistent with, with expectations, the inactivated vaccine, which is administered intramuscularly, does a really great job at inducing strong titers of neutralizing antibodies against the influenza virus. Uh, in the serum. LAIV though, um, while it does induce antibodies in the serum, the, the relative boost is, is much more modest. However, what we found was that if we looked at mucosal IgA antibodies induced by LAIV, these, these correlated quite well with the protection that we observed against infection in the context of this trial. So, Although both vaccines work equally well, the mechanism through which they mediate protection is very different. We then went on to ask a question about whether or not um, repeated seasonal vaccination was capable of inducing the secondary class of antibodies that I mentioned, uh, broadly neutralizing antibodies that bind to the hemagglutinin stock domain. And the reason we were interested in this was because in adults, seasonal vaccination really doesn't induce these broadly neutralizing antibodies very well. And that's because as adults, We've all seen flu multiple times over the course of our lives, either through infection or vaccination or combinations thereof. And our immune response prefers to generate antibodies against the highly variable head domain of flu. Now, if those antibodies are a good match, they're really effective at preventing infection because they're potent neutralizers of virus. The problem is that they're highly specific. And what we want to do is move towards the generation of vaccines that are not so reliant on having uh, a perfect match between the viral strain included in the vaccine and the strain that circulates, so that not only can we mitigate the effects of vaccine mismatch, but so that we could prophylactically provide a layer of immunity in the population that would also protect against the emergence of novel viruses capable of causing pandemics. But what we wanted to understand was in children who have uh, limited or in certain cases, no previous exposure to flu, could seasonal vaccines induce those antibodies in that context where the immune system hasn't been sort of primed to 
preferentially recognize the head domain. So to do this, we selected samples from Mark's first RCT, which was uh, a comparison between inactivated influenza vaccination and uh, hepatitis A vaccination uh, in these Hutterite children. And what we wanted to ask is after three consecutive seasons of vaccination, were the children who received the inactivated flu vaccine capable of, of generating boosts in broadly neutralizing antibody titers? This work um, was led by uh, Sergei Yegorov, uh, a really uh, talented uh, postdoctoral fellow who's co-supervised by Dr. Loeb and I. What you can see here is that indeed, when children were vaccinated over three consecutive seasons with the inactivated flu vaccine, they did mount very strong, um, broadly neutralizing antibody titers, which were much stronger than the boost that we observed in individuals who received the control Hep A vaccine. Um, what, what was interesting about this though, is that we did see some boost in, in antibodies in these children. And, and we presume that this is because some of these children were actually asymptomatically infected by the 2009 swine flu virus over the course of the study. And that virus uh, has been known to induce broadly neutralizing antibodies. Nevertheless, this induction was, was clearly much, much stronger in the children who received the vaccine, uh, as you can see down here. We then wanted to ask, are different vaccine types capable of boosting these broadly neutralizing antibodies? Because this has really important implications for what types of vaccines or what types of vaccine strategies we might use to administer a so-called universal vaccine. So using samples from our second RCT, we asked the question of whether um, IIV or LAIV were um, differentially capable of inducing these broadly neutralizing antibodies in children. And what we found was that actually both vaccines induced these broadly neutralizing antibodies quite well. In fact, it, the, the two vaccine types were almost equivalent in their ability to produce broadly neutralizing antibodies uh, in the serum of uh, vac vaccines. Likewise, these antibodies were, were equally capable of inducing vaccine-matched serum IgA, though there was a trend that the um, inactivated vaccine did a slightly better job at inducing IgG, and this was sort of consistent with our um, earlier study that I told you about where we saw that the inactivated vaccine does a much better job at inducing serum IgG titers. We then wanted to ask whether the vaccines were similarly capable of inducing mucosal broadly neutralizing antibodies. Uh, and that's um, what we're showing here, looking at mucosal uh, anti-stock IgA and IgG. And what you can see is that actually these, um, these vaccines were similarly capable of inducing uh, mucosal antibodies in these children as well. Now, one of the real interests we had in the wake of these studies was, was asking a question of sort of how IgA works to protect against viral infection. Uh, almost all of the work in the flu fields um, uh, has been focused on addressing how IgG protects because, of, of course, it's the most dominant antibody isotype um, present in serum. And so relatively little is known about the actual mechanisms through which IgA is capable of protecting against flu. Now, one of the things that our group and others have shown over a number of years is that these broadly neutralizing antibodies that bind to the conserved stem domain of hemagglutinin work in a fundamentally different way than antibodies that bind the head domain. Antibodies that bind the head domain essentially work in the classical way. They prevent viral attachment to host cells and in doing so neutralize virus and prevent infection. Broadly neutralizing antibodies, by contrast, actually don't do a very good job of preventing the virus from getting into the cell. The way they work is primarily by binding to hemagglutinin on the surface of infected cells 
um, and recruiting immune cells that then eliminate those cells via FC-dependent effector functions. And what's quite interesting about the mechanism through this works is that stock antibodies do this much, much better than antibodies that bind the head domain because of this, what we call a two point of contact model. The two critical points of contact are the immune cell's ability to recognize the antibody via its FC receptor. So the FC receptor of the immune cell binds the FC region of the antibody. But because the head domain of hemagglutinin is not occluded when stock antibodies bind to hemagglutinin, hemagglutinin retains its ability to bind sialic acid, which is its host cell receptor. This strengthens the avidity of the interaction between the immune cell and the infected cell and really enhances the quality of FC-dependent effector functions that are induced. Again, though, most of what we know about these FC-dependent effector functions, we know because they've been studied in the context of IgG. And so Hannah Stacy, uh, a PhD student in my lab who is absolutely exceptional and is nearing um, her PhD defense, wanted to ask the question of how, does, how do IgA broadly neutralizing antibodies work? To do this, she started by looking at neutrophils because neutrophils express high levels of the FC alpha receptor, the FC receptor responsible for binding IgA. And what she did was, was to start a really simple experiment. She made immune complexes by mixing either IgG and flu together or IgA and flu together, and then put those immune complexes on neutrophils and asked how they responded. Neutrophils also express high levels of FC gamma receptors, the FC receptors that bind to IgG antibodies. What Hannah found really interestingly is that there was this really profound morphological change in the neutrophils when they were incubated with the IgA immune complexes. And indeed, what was going on here is that these neutrophils were undergoing, an, were undergoing netosis, a programmed cell death pathway where they essentially extrude, extrude chromatin to trap pathogens. What was particularly interesting, though, is we only saw this in the context of monomeric IgA, the type of IgA primarily found in serum. Secretory IgA, the IgA that we find at our mucosal surfaces, was incapable of inducing netosis. And later it became obvious the reason for this, which is that, of course, netosis required the ability of these immune complexes to engage CD89 or the FC alpha receptor. If we block the FC alpha receptor, this goes away. As it turns out, the secretory component of IgA actually sterically hinders the ability of the FC alpha receptor to recognize IgA, which explains why secretory IgA was incapable of, of um, stimulating this unique effector function. What was really interesting is that this wasn't a flu-specific phenomenon. This happens any time an FC alpha receptor bearing neutrophil sees an IgA immune complex. So Hannah was able to repeat these observations using SARS-CoV-2, HIV, and even um, citrullinated fibrinogen, which is an autoantigen associated with rheumatoid arthritis. And what was even cooler, I think, is that Hannah was able to show that not only do these nets trap viral particles, but they're also capable of inact inactivating them, showing that this really is a, an antiviral effector function. Now, well, um, active vaccines are an important component of our arsenal pr to protect infection. Passive vaccines are also really important. And of course, we saw uh, monoclonal antibodies deployed in the context of um, this pandemic. Uh, some of the problems with these antibodies, though, is that they often have to be administered by infusion which is a real barrier often to getting these antibodies to the people who need them most. And they can be very susceptible to mutations in the virus that change antigenicity. So Ali Zhang in my lab wanted to address this, this problem and ask whether we could make better monoclonal antibody-based therapies um, to protect against flu using a different approach. So I showed you earlier how these um, uh, antibodies mediate protection via FC-dependent effector functions. What Ali realized is that neuraminidase, the other viral glycoprotein, is constantly cleaving um, the interaction between hemagglutinin and sialic acid, this critical second point of contact. 
So he, he wondered whether if he added oseltamivir, which is an approved antiviral that treats flu by inhibiting neuraminidase activity, if this would stabilize that point of contact and make these antibodies better, and maybe also reduce the chances of, um, uh, of resistance occurring. So first, Ali did experiments to see whether by adding oseltamivir together with broadly neutralizing antibodies, if he could enhance uh, ADCC activity or, or the FC dependent effector function that those antibodies mediate. And what he found was in, indeed he could. We, Ali looked at this in the context of um, several different um, influenza virus strains. And we know that, that this requires FC-FC receptor interactions because when Ali used the same antibody with a point mutation that abrogated its ability to engage FC gamma receptors, this activity goes away completely, even when he added oseltamivir. Now that's all great in vitro. What, what we really wanted to know though is does this matter in vivo? And so to that end, Ali designed a prophylactic and treatment experiment to test this question. In the prophylaxis model, Ali gave antibody and oseltamivir prior to exposure. So this would be akin to what we might do in a high risk setting like a nursing home to prevent an outbreak. But we also wanted to know if it worked as a treatment in individuals, or in this case in mice, that had already been infected. And what he found in both the prophylaxis and treatment models was indeed when he combined 6F12, a broadly neutralizing monoclonal antibody against flu with oseltamivir, the protection and reduction in morbidity was substantially better than either therapy alone. Now, in the last slide here, what I want to tell you is, is a really interesting secondary observation um, that uh, Mark and I uh, made together with um, Andrew Chen, who is a fourth year honors student in my laboratory, who's now uh, in medical school um, and did this project in, in collaboration with our two labs. One of the things we wanted to know is if influenza vaccination might have any impact in reducing risk of infection with other pathogens. And thankfully in Mark's initial randomized control trials, whenever um, somebody was infected, they were swabbed and a multiplex PCR was performed to see what um, pathogen was causing their infection. Uh, a lot of times this was flu, but as you can imagine, other infections were caused by other viruses that co-circulate with flu, things like RSV, coronavirus, metanumavirus, et cetera. What Andrew found really interestingly in doing uh, a secondary analysis of, of the data from this first RCT was that there actually did appear to be quite a profound risk reduction in infection by seasonal coronavirus, specifically in the influenza vaccinated group. Now this in the total group didn't reach significance, but this isn't too surprising because of course our study or Mark's study wasn't, wasn't initially powered to address this question. But you can see in age groups where the majority of infections occurred that this, this um, observation actually became significant. Now, of course, we were interested in you know, the biological mechanism that might explain that. And really interestingly, what we found was that people who had been vaccinated with the flu vaccine actually experienced the boost in their antibodies against seasonal coronavirus. Um, but we didn't observe this in hep A vaccinated people. So this really was an effect specific to the flu vaccine. Of course, we also looked against SARS-CoV-2. We found a similar trend, although this didn't quite reach significance. So in closing, the perspectives I wanna share with you today are that prophylactic protection against pandemic pathogens is essential to protecting the global population from future infectious disease outbreaks. Both active and passive immunization strategies are important tools to prevent infection. And while parenteral vaccination is convenient, it's probably not the best way to protect against mucosal pathogens. Mucosal immunity is distinct from systemic immunity in both form and function, and IG appears to play an important role in protection mediated by mucosal vaccines in the context that I showed you today, specifically in the context of LAIV. Um, and really interestingly, influenza vaccination may have other knock-on effects in reducing risk against other viral infections, for example, seasonal coronavirus. So with that, I'd like to thank 
um, uh, the individuals involved in this study, especially my lab and uh, Dr. Loeb, with, with whom uh, I've been a longtime collaborator, uh, colleagues at McMaster, Western, and Mount Sinai, and of course our funders. And with there, uh, I'll wrap up, um, and I'm sure Dr. Loeb and I will be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much to both of you for your great talks. Um, I'm going to move to the questions. Um, so the first one is from Ali. Uh, for Mark, uh, is the pathogenesis of cardiovascular outcomes from influenza similar to those outcomes from COVID? And are there any studies on the effects of COVID vaccination on cardiovascular events? Um, okay, well, the, the short answer to the first question is it's not known. So in COVID, um, there's clearly um, myocardial injury uh, and, and there's a prothrombotic and pro-inflammatory state, but, but it, you know, the actual mechanism isn't really known. Whereas in influenza, there have been pro-inflammatory cytokines, into, into, endothelial cell dysfunction, tachycardia, plasma viscosity, uh, release of catecholamines, all of those have been mechanisms proposed. But even with flu, no one knows what the overriding mechanism is is so the answer is uh, we don't know um and then the second was the the the, the question was related to covid vaccination and what, what was it again Dora? are there any studies on the effects of covid vaccination on cardiovascular events uh randomized control trials i'm not aware of but i haven't done a search for uh for observational studies so there might be but i'm not a, i'm not aware i haven't searched for that recently okay thanks um, so another question for Mark from Jerry. Um, these results point out that the timing of influenza vaccine is critical, right? If you miss vaccination before the peak, there's no significant advantage. Um, yeah, it's. I mean, it's. It, it's. Yeah, it's. It's really like that. It's basically, um, you know, the, the vaccine is only going to work when there's circulating influenza, right? And and the bottom line is we had a choice in terms of what we put as the primary outcome, and we should have, in retrospect, we should have separated out as peak versus non-peak as the primary outcome. But what, what what's important, it's you know, even if you miss the peak, as long as you're getting it during the flu season when there's flu circulating, you'll get a you'll get some sort of protection. So that, that to me is the take home message there. Okay, the next question is from Amy Gilgrass. Uh, why has the uptake of the live attenuated intranasal flu vaccine been so poor in Canada? Um, I'm happy to take that and uh, and Mark can certainly add, add follow up. I think actually one of the big issues is accessibility in Canada. Um, in the US, the vaccine is, is much more accessible, accessible. We've had supply issues here in recent years. Um, and in addition, it's just not as broadly available in places like pharmacies as the inactivated vaccine. Um, there may also be some sort of lingering misperceptions among, among um, pharmacists and other healthcare providers about relative effectiveness that sort of lingers from the confusing back and forth uh, ASIP recommendations. But um, I think accessibility is probably the biggest limitation. It's just not as easy to come by. I, I don't know if Mark has other thoughts. Uh, yeah, I, I fully agree that there, there might be this lingering effect from uh, ASEP recommendations and the fact that, you know, some provinces, they'll, they'll make it available for, you know, those people who have confirmed needle phobia. But, uh, but in general, I, I, I fully agree with you. Um, I have two quick questions for you guys. Um, first of all, is there any advantage to combining intramuscular and intranasal vaccination? I know you guys are are going that route potentially for COVID, but what about flu? Yeah, so in flu, um, this has been studied in uh, in both animal models and actually in clinical trials. Um, indeed, the first ever clinical trial of a universal vaccine that was conducted by my postdoctoral mentor used a, as one of the arms of that study, an approach where they gave um, uh, inactivated vaccine and LEIV. There's good immunological reason to think that there's benefit there. Obviously systemic immunity we know can be protective. That immunity does reach the lungs, but when you vaccinate in the lungs, what we see is this immunological phenomenon called, uh, people often call it prime pull. 
So essentially, when you revaccinate mucosally, you pull a bunch of that immunity and concentrate it in the lungs. Um, this has also been observed in the context of hybrid immunity for COVID-19. People who get mRNA vaccination have relatively weak mucosal responses initially, but if they get a subsequent infection, they have ragingly strong mucosal immunity because of that, that prime pull effect. Um, so, so I think, <laughs> I think um, there, is, there is good rationale to think that, that that may be an effective strategy. What I'll note, um, because I'm sure Mark would note this, is that there has never been a good comparative study, though, to see if, if in a randomized control setting, there's a real clinical benefit to that type of approach. So those studies have been done in, in sort of isolation, uh, addressing immunogenicity. There's never been a head-to-head -head of systemic vaccination only versus uh, this sort of prime pull strategy. I feel like it must be challenging to do that if you're, if you're constantly running to catch up with the particular strain that you're vaccinating against anyways. It so is, and I, I mean, one of the really interesting things that's difficult about flu RCTs, and again, Mark knows this better than anyone else, is that flu is so different from year to year that you really do need to perform multi-year trials to be able to make generalizable conclusions because a weird thing could happen in one year, a vaccine mismatch, an egg adaptation, who knows what. Um, uh, and so I think that's a caveat to RCT study design in flu. While RCTs are our best you know, sort of um, uh, are the best designed to, to generate high quality evidence. The evidence is just specific to the context in which the RCT was performed. And so mm -hmm. you have to be very careful about generalizing, uh, especially in the flu field where things can vary so much. And, and there's tons of heterogeneity, even within, you do an RCT, a multi-country RCT, there's heterogeneity, but that's how randomized control trials work, right? They're not, you're looking at average results and then, you know, it's another uh, area to, to explore an in-depth look at the reasons for heterogeneity. So we fully agree. Okay, last quick question, because we're out of time. Uh, looking into your crystal balls, how do you think uh, the upcoming flu season is gonna change based on the pandemic or changes to our, you know, public health measures, et cetera, vaccine uh, hesitancy. Well, I, I could start with that one because I, I, I think it's, uh, if we look at, at what ha what's happened in Australia, they had a, a very severe uh, influenza season, um, you know, in the, in the sort of late spring. And even in Canada, if you look at rates in, of Ontario in, and particularly in Quebec, I mean, the percent positivity in uh, March or April in Quebec was very high. So, I would anticipate a pretty robust flu season coming down the pipelines. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, what was what was astounding, and I think in many ways um, encouraging, is that obviously the public health measures that were in effect for COVID were e extraordinarily effective in in reducing risk of flu. Basically, for you know that whole first year of the pandemic. There were no flu cases in countries that had those types of public health measures uh, in effect. Now, obviously, we don't want to have that severity or that um, intensity of public health measures present all of the time. But I think it has taught us that there are things that we can do that are relatively non-invasive to potentially reduce risk. Um, you know, the simplest things are, are just changes in culture, like you know, staying home instead of going to work mm. when you are sick. Um, obviously, you know, there's there's probably some role for masking, at least in in source control um, uh, of of transmission and and because it's a relatively um, you know benign non pharmaceutical intervention. There's probably no harm in doing that in high risk situations, especially if people are ill themselves. Um, so yeah, I agree with Mark. There's going to be a, a probably a raging flu season this year. It underscores the importance of, of getting vaccinated for flu. Um, and, and that will throw a new kink into issues around hospital capacity that we haven't really seen, um, I think, in the past few years where COVID has sort of been the, the boss and, uh, and we haven't had 
co-circulation of flu, which, which impacts largely the same types of high risk groups with the added addition of very young children being at much higher risk relative to what we've seen um, in the context of COVID-19. All right, well, thank you both. And on that note, uh, everyone should leave now and make an appointment to get their flu vaccine for the upcoming winter. Thanks again, uh, everybody for joining us today and I will see you in November for the next edition. Take care everyone.